I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. Thanks for joining us today. We got something really cool for you to check out. Ex Machina, new monitor brand that's joining the Sweetwater family. This is Dev Avedon. Happy to have you here, co-founder of the company. Man, I mean, I was up listening to these speakers uh, up in one of the rooms and wow. Thank you so much. They're like NASA in a box. I mean, we've definitely put an enormous <laughs> amount of science and engineering into these. Yeah. It's really a pleasure to be here. I mean, my entire recording and studio career started 15 years ago with Kurt Martin selling me my first setup. I've you know, had a great relationship with Sweetwater ever since as a customer, and I'm so glad to be a vendor now. Wow, that's, that's so cool. <laughs> so tell us about the company. Definitely X. Machina, no Deus in there, no Machina, no, no Machinas. No, <laughs> just just Ex Machina Soundworks. Um, the the joke being Ex Machina Latin for out of the machine. So these are the things that take your music out of the box. Um, nice. But uh, the company was founded originally with a couple of partners of mine, uh, William Say, who's an artificial intelligence and machine learning expert, and Dimitri Wolfwood, who's a brilliant circuit designer. And when we were initially starting to do this, we had this dream of building the American Abbey Road, where if we needed a microphone, we made our own microphone. And if we needed a console, we designed and built our own console. Mm. And over time, as we were beginning to develop the designs for these, some of the work that we were ended up doing, especially in the you know, machine learning area and in digital signal processing area and what we were starting to be able to achieve with transducers, we really all sat down and said, you know, we've, we've got to do this as a real manufacturing company. And so about five years after the initial conversations and about four years now after the company was formed, uh, here we are and, and this is the sort of fruits of our labor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're designed to be sort of the ultimate reference monitors for recording studios. We've got two different models here and a lot of innovative use of uh, materials and technology in these. But of course, what it all comes down to is what you were really aiming for was again that reference monitor thing to be able to put these speakers in your room and they just give you back exactly what you need to hear to create a mix. Yeah, precisely. Like we want to free you as much as possible from the idea that you need alts and you need confidence checks and for all of these mediums that you have to translate to now, it, you know, vinyls made a comeback. You know, video didn't kill the radio star. Right. Uh, you you have you know serious streaming. You have Spotify. We wanted to give you something that in this context, especially in an era where there ha are constant recalls, you have to get your work out fast. We wanted to give you something that you knew you could absolutely trust. And so we made these simply most linear loudspeakers we can in terms of frequency response, in terms of timing response, in terms of transient response. The way I usually describe it to people is your creative choices that you want to make at the preamp, at the microphone, at the console. This might be how you like the steering to feel on a car or how you like the throttle response to feel, but your loudspeakers are your windshield. If they lie to you, you're gonna make bad decisions. Right, right, exactly. Well, what's, uh, of course, you can look at the specs on these monitors and they're fantastic. I mean, they're just like the, the you, you've hit all those kind of key things that you wanna have, but there's also a lot of analog material work <laughs> being done here, especially in the drivers. And I, I was fascinated, these are actually coaxial mid-range tweeters and then a woofer on the bottom. Let's start with the tweeter. Tell us about the material that's used in those and how that benefits what's happening here. Oh, absolutely. So the coaxial driver design is maybe my favorite physical part of the loudspeaker. It was a five year long development process. We begin with the actual material that the diaphragms are made of. So the mid-range and the tweeter are made from the same core material. That material is called Techstream. It is a spread toe, thin ply woven carbon fiber. Huh. Um, that's a mouthful. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> what it essentially means is when we look at what most people call carbon fiber diaphragms, they are fiber reinforcements in a plastic or epoxy matrix. It's a little bit of fiber that's reinforcing a plastic that holds the shape together. This is not that. These are long extruded tapes of fiber that we can interlock in any way that we want with very, very little epoxy or glue. These are 97% carbon by weight. So the material itself already gives you a huge advantage there. It's as stiff, it's stiffer than titanium, but it's as light as paper. Wow. That's not even the cool part. The cool part about this is it is an anisotropic material. So the fiber has a lay. It's very stiff in one direction. It's less stiff in a different direction. Normally when we look at woven type materials, like when we see Kevlar cones, we try to make them quasi-isotropic. We lay them together at 45 degree angles to try to emulate the stiffness being the same in all directions. We did not do that with these diaphragms. We employed a machine learning process in optimizing them to set the weak points of the fibers 
exactly where they're most beneficial to actively control and suppress resonances and ringing in the diaphragm. Hmm. So for example, in the, in the tweeter, it's an incredibly stiff and light material, so it already doesn't break up until 38, 39 kilocycles. But when it does want to begin to ring, as all things do, all things have resonant frequencies, the top portions of that waveform hit very specifically optimized weak portions in the fiber, like putting a moat in a pond where the ripple hits a moat and they cancel. So not only do you get something that's extremely fast and extremely precise in terms of transient response, you get even better than just a damped material. You get an active control of your resonances for something that is both very non-fatiguing and easy to work on for a long period of time because you don't have those distortion products modulated down, but that's also giving you incredible high frequency extension. You know, when we were developing the last set of these prototypes, a number of our engineers did blind listening tests comparing these to our reference point, which is a full density lab grown diamond, and most of us preferred this. Wow, <laughs> that's incredible. That's incredible. So did you translate that then to the mid-range driver as well? Yes, absolutely we did. And in the mid-range, we're trying to do slightly different things. So the tweeter in, in your speaker is the anchor of your relay race, right? There's no crossover for it to go to. The mid-range in this case, because it's coaxial, is really affecting the way the tweeter is sending energy out into the room. It's going to act like the throat of a horn. In this particular case, what the uh, composite sound material, this metamodal TX material that we're working with here, allows us to do is it allows us complete geometric freedom to shape the mid-range as a mathematically optimal waveguide. So this is a 90 by 90 conical oblate spheroid waveguide, so it throws energy within that big 90 degree cone, very, very even in terms of its power and time out into the world. And normally this would start to cause problems in terms of its performance as a mid-range driver itself. To get that shape to really be good for a waveguide, you've got to make the overall geometry less stiff. But because we have all of this flexibility in terms of how the fibers are woven into it, we can not only compensate for that, we can also compensate for the way the mid-range wants to beam naturally by reinforcing specific parts of the edge and make sure that it's a nice even transition of that energy out into the room. That's crazy. Absolutely crazy. The other thing that I, I came across somewhere when I was looking at these is the way that you're crossing things over allows that mid-range driver to not move quite as much, which allows it to stay more stable as a waveguide for the tweeter, which I, I had never thought about that being a, a thing before. <laughs> I mean, that's actually, that's an incredible point. I'm really glad that you brought it up because this is something that can plague a, a mid-range um, that's acting as a coaxial if it has to move a long distance. You get Doppler effect. The waveguide's moving relative to where the tweeter is and you can hear that modulation if it moves far enough. Well, because we have some very fancy DSP in this loudspeaker that we'll talk about a little bit later, this driver doesn't actually have to move very far at all. In fact, at its maximum volume, it's still moving so little that the lowest frequency it would begin to affect in modulation is well over 30 kilohertz. Hmm. That's crazy. So you've just eliminated that as an, as an issue, really, with the, with the coaxial design. Yeah, that's gone. The center point of the tweeter is, is perfect relative to where it needs to load the throat of that horn and that waveguide. And we've even thought about the surround here. You get a problem with traditional coaxials called suck out, where some of the energy reflects off of the edge, of the big lip that you'll usually see on a surround. It comes in out of phase with the energy that's going straight forward. And you get this big dip on axis. By hanging the surround underneath the back side, we're able to eliminate that problem entirely. Wow, crazy. You guys thought about everything. We tried to, certainly. Yeah, yeah. So, so how did that translate down then to the, the woofer? Is it also a unique material in, in the design? Well, the uh, diaphragm materials on the subwoofers are, are pretty traditional. They're a high silicon content aluminum alloy. Very stiff, very precise stuff. We don't really need the composite sound material in the subwoofer because it's only doing very, very long wavelengths. The natural ringing frequency of this driver for where we cross it, which is 200 hertz, is already three octaves away from the crossover point. So it's just none of it's even getting in there. I see. Um, what we choose aluminum for in this particular context is that it is a very sturdy material at thicknesses and we need that because these things can move. Yeah. Um, the motor design is really special in these subwoofers. Um, this is a collaboration over a long period of time with Seas in Norway. Seas in Norway does all our designs, which are full custom. We design them in collaboration with them. 
And in this case, this is derived from their extreme series architecture subwoofer. Uh, this was first deployed in the Linkwitz Labs Orion systems. Linkwitz commissioned them for them. And we took a look at this design, said this is really cool. We have some ideas of how to make this a little bit smaller, more manageable, and to improve the motor structure design of this. And this is what we came up with, and it is just a monstrous piece of a subwoofer. As I mentioned, these are crossing at 200 hertz to the mid-range, so this really is a true subwoofer. It's, it's not a large woofer. Mm -hmm. And it's capable of 28 millimeters of linear peak-to-peak -peak excursion, so that's clipple verified at 80% motor strength, and 56 millimeters before damage. So more than an inch of... More, more, more than, than an inch peak-to-peak -peak linear, more than uh, almost two inches peak-to-peak -peak before damage. That is crazy. And we have some videos, actually, you can see on the website of, of what we do in sweeps for burn-in to you know, make sure that everything's working correctly. And you see them moving in places where it's like, isn't that going to break them? I'm like, no, we've let it do this for 48 hours straight. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's incredible. That's incredible. Now, another interesting thing about this design is that you're not using ports to reinforce the low end or anything. These are sealed cabinets. They are sealed cabinets, and that's one of the reasons why these subwoofers have to be able to move as much air as they're capable of. Because the reason you have a port in a loudspeaker is to assist your low frequency output. Especially as you approach the tuning of that port, that port begins to take over more and more of the work as it resonates in frequency with the drivers, produces this tuned column of air, helps you to produce more bass output. But ports have a lot of problems the first problem of ports is group delay. Nothing that we do, nothing that you do with room correction, nothing that we do with the digital signal processing internally will ever be able to change the fact that the port, especially as you approach its resonant frequency, is always going to be out of phase with the output of the driver. It's a fixed acoustic relationship. The second problem is that ports have turbulence and chuffing. So that sound that you can hear sometimes when you drive a port too hard, it's not just annoying, it is an indication that the velocity of the air as it's exiting the port is trying to decelerate to the speed of the air in the room around you too fast. And by doing so, you're creating turbulence and destruction of your wavefront. And this in turn means that you get volume dependent bass. As that velocity starts to get too high, you get a destruction of your bass waveform. And we really did not want that. We wanted these to track very linearly from very soft to very loud in terms of your tonal balance. Okay. I'm just going to have to say I believe you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all amazing. That's also, if I understand it correctly, part of the reason why you have the two sizes, because you're using the second subwoofer in the uh, larger speaker to allow you to maintain that while still getting more low frequency extension and more volume out of it. Yes, that's absolutely correct. This is another nice thing about a sealed box, especially a sealed box with digital signal processing, is that you can kind of set your trade-off wherever you want in terms of how low you let it go up until the resonant frequency of the driver mm -hmm. versus how loud you want the driver to go. And so we, we like the fact in this line, this being sort of the, the bread and butter of our range, that it's the same driver. It has all the same tonal characteristics, but by doubling the number of subs on Quasar, we can linearize it a little bit lower because we need half the excursion for the same amount of volume. We can give you a little more absolute output. So if you're a producer who works on EDM or techno or hip hop modern styles with a lot of bass and you want th something that is loud both for check and for clients, Quasar can really deliver it for you. Right, right. Now both of our both uh, models, Quasar and Pulsar, uh, use the same material for the cabinets and even that's different yes. than what we've seen in, in monitors before. Yeah, we, we tried to leave no stone unturned in this regard. Yeah, I think the closed ecosystems make sense because the loudspeaker is the holistic sum of its parts. You know, it's, it's one thing to have a shiny new tweeter design, but if that's not reinforced by the other things that you've done, then you're only as good as your weakest link. So the cabinet material in this case is made from a material called Valchromat. We like Valchromat for a lot of reasons. Before anything else, it's an FSC certified material. It's very sustainable. It doesn't use any toxic glues. There's no formaldehyde in it. Even the finish that we use is a material called Rubio Monocote, which is an oil-based catalyst. It's zero VOC, completely non-toxic. Valchromat gives us performance benefits that are very significant. So Valchromat's about 30% denser than standard MDF, which that's good on its own merits because the heavier the cabinet is, the harder it is to vibrate and shake, and you don't want the cabinet to vibrate and shake. As a professor of mine once put it, if it moves, it's a driver. <laughs> and the cabinet is a very bad driver. <laughs> um, the other thing that it has is about three times the bending stiffness of standard MDF. Um, so it's much harder to get it to flex. 
But then the part that I think is actually the most beneficial is it has longer fibers within the actual matrix itself. So a normal MDF is like chopped sawdust and it gets glued up into a block. If you look, you can see some of these long fibers in the speckling of the material. And what they do is they create a lot of friction relative to each other. And so when a vibrational wave starts to want to transmit through it, that friction turns that vibration very quickly into a small amount of heat, and it helps the vibration die down very fast. Hmm. Plus, you can actually machine and oh. get the uh, edges rounded and all those kind of good things that, uh, that look so cool, too. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the really nice things about Valkramat as a material is that it is a very precise material to machine with. You know, it's got very tight tolerances. And this was something aesthetically that I really wanted to achieve with these where you'll notice we don't have the usual gasket or overhung lip on the front. Everything looks like a seamless box. And that's because these speakers actually press fit together out of our CNC mill. We machine them to 200 micron tolerance. Okay. So even before they're glued up, they'll, they'll hold together a little bit by friction. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's incredible. So I have to ask you, we're going to move on from here. I'll, 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 uh, I'm really anxious to hear about the DSP applications that you have going on in here because they're also super cool. How would these sound without the DSP? They'd still sound pretty good. Uh -huh. um, and the interesting thing is if you select the low latency mode, you can basically hear like what they would sound like as a very good analog okay, design. Okay, well that was something I was going to ask you about is there's two modes and we'll get to that I think when we talk about the DSP. But Certainly. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, this is an acoustically and you know, electronically very high performance loudspeaker with very cutting edge material sciences. The DSP is there to allow us to do things that just cannot be done with f the, the physics of the how a driver works, especially a Kellogg driver. They, they let us kind of bend those laws of physics a little bit. And so, yes, they're doing traditional things that DSP does very well. They're giving us very precise crossovers. They give us very precise like over excursion protection and limiting, but they're also doing things that are much more advanced than that that cannot be done without DSP. Right, right. And I wanted to bring that up because I, I think it's important to recognize that you're not using DSP to make these sound good. These sound good <laughs> already, oh. and, and you're just kind of tweaking the to take it to kind of the ultimate level of the specs. Well, for what the DSP lets us do essentially is, is break those laws of physics of what these things can do otherwise analog. We designed these as an analog loudspeaker first to be already what we thought was the highest performance thing you could buy. And then when we brought the digital signal processing in, it was to say, okay, these are physical laws that all things that have motion and momentum must obey. Can we cheat those laws a little bit by using very advanced digital signal processing? And this is actually where my co-founder, Will, comes into all of this, from his background working on you know, laser interferometry and artificial intelligence and very smart dude. <laughs> <laughs> Craziness. Yeah, that, that's just awesome. That's just awesome. So you mentioned the DSP is doing the crossovers very precisely and uh, handling some of the other, uh, the excursion control and some of those things. But the two things that fascinated me to hear about was the way you're using them to, first of all, even out amplitude, but also to control phase and how important that is, especially with the relationship of the drivers and things. Yeah, that's hugely important. And phase is the you know, misbegotten stepchild of loudspeaker design. And nobody quotes measurements on it. Nobody really talks about it. And you really need to. Phase linearity is essentially timing coherence. It is, you know, these, these are sound is a wave that travels in space. It has different timing relationships. It's a thing that has a relationship between power and time. Frequency response is the power. Phase is the time, and the phase is hugely important because the phase is how you have imaging. It's how you echolocate. If you pan something in a mix, if you have a delay that you have ping-ponging, if you have something that you want to use as a phaser that creates a psychoacoustic sense of stereo motion around you, the phase linearity of your loudspeakers is really going to determine how well that actually translates as cues that your brain can interpret. And so our digital signal processing take some of the things that you would otherwise be largely stuck with. Um, there are things you can do to compensate a little bit in analog, but you are always going to have some degree of phase offset in an analog, an all analog design, because there are impedance changes in the driver and there are phase curves of the drivers themselves. The crossovers introduce phase shift, physical differences in space introduce phase shift. Our calibration process allows us to completely eliminate that phase shift. It is able to bring the loudspeakers back to a point where every frequency 
from 30 hertz to 30 kilohertz arrives within 15 degrees of excess phase. Mm -hmm. Right. So is this different from other manufacturers have said that their speakers are lined up in time and you know they'll they'll uh, they'll mention those kind of things but this goes way beyond that doesn't it, it? it does and there certainly are other loudspeakers out there that are doing things to try to correct with digital signal processing for phase ours is able to do it i think significantly more accurately mm -hmm. but you see this really show up in our impulse response measurements which are a sort of convolved way to talk about both frequency and time as an impulse comes in and you want to see that very linear spike our digital signal processing is able to go well beyond just correcting for the group delay and the phase shifts of physical differences or the impedance of a driver. It's also able to look ahead a little bit in time. The full calibration mode has about 46 milliseconds of latency so that we can do this. Anticipate how the momentum of the driver might cause overshoot. It might not settle in time and actively slow it down by introducing a slight portion of a negative phase waveform into the voice coil. So essentially, you can take even a square wave, something where the driver has to start and stop almost instantaneously, run it through this and put a microphone in front of it and measure that square wave, almost exactly the same coming back. Nice, nice. And that, that allows some benefits. You mentioned 15 degrees of phase coherence, if you will, among everything that's going on. Yeah, plus or minus 15 is what we quote as our absolute spec, but uh, 100 hertz and up, it's more like plus or minus 5. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> so basically, it's spot on. Yeah, and it's, it's perfectly timing accurate. It's the same thing with frequency response, right? You're within 1 dB or the entire range? Yeah, we're plus or minus 1 dB um, within the quoted range for cutoff. So in that case, that's uh, 35 hertz on the low end for these and 29 hertz for these. We're F1. Hmm. Um, same on the top end. We actually intentionally limit these at 30 kilohertz on the top end, even though they can go further uh, for all sorts of reasons that get into papers from people like Dan Lavery and psychoacoustic research that is a little too nerdy for this. <laughs> but more or less, uh, we the things that you're going to get if you let your speakers continue to reproduce up there are nothing that's useful to you. You're going to you make them an invitation to get Disney radio coming back and you're going to make the amplifiers work less well and it's, it's just that's not helping you so we get rid of it. Sure, sure. The other benefit is that the speakers are like completely 100% matched from unit to unit to unit. You have like a signature for each one, correct? Yes, uh, we have uh, our engineers in-house every individual loudspeaker that comes off the line goes into our hemi anechoic chamber so we our fools that we are, built a legit working hemi anechoic chamber in Brooklyn. Spring decoupled it on every wall and the floor on eight inch concrete slabs. And got, you know, something that's an effective state of the art hemi anechoic chamber down to about 40 hertz. And the loudspeaker gets a, a series of measurements taken on it. We get the specific impulse response frequency curve, phase curve for that specific loudspeaker down to the component tolerances of like small changes in a glue joint, for example, or small changes in the winding of a voice coil. And every single one of those is corrected back to exactly linear. So every serial number of a given product model will match every other serial number within 0.1 dB of sensitivity. Which that's huge for stereo, but when you start talking about surround or certainly Atmos, I mean, all these things factor into having a, a system that performs really well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a nice thing in that regard as well in that we take a sort of set canonical average of what we want for a given voltage into the loudspeaker to produce in terms of a given uh, acoustic output out, and we set that as the same for all of our models. So the models match each other in terms of input sensitivity as well. Nice, nice. So it makes it very easy to configure whatever system you want to uh, to use them with. Man, it, it, uh, the other part about this that, I, again, going back to, I guess, what really matters is what they sound like. Uh, when I was listening to them, one of the things that really jumps out is the uh, the size, if you will, of the sweet spot and the forward back consistency of, of that, that sweet spot. Can you talk about that a little bit as well? Sure, and, and this is really when, you know, what we've talked about a little bit before about the performance of the waveguides and when we talk about phase coherence, this is what they add up to. Like what you actually hear when you have a, a speaker that is exactly timing accurate and that has a waveguide that is constant directivity, that's throwing the same power into the room very evenly within that conical average, is you're not stuck in one spot in terms of where you can center your mono elements, how you can hear stereo motion. It gives you this enormously wide sweet spot to work with. So you can be very close to them. You can be even a little bit off to the side. Maybe you want to reach up and make an EQ decision on a console and you have to get a little bit closer to the loudspeaker. 
they're not going to fall apart when you do that. You can still make an accurate decision. Right, right, and that's, that's such a, a big deal. Now, are these aimed more at, uh, I mean, even the, the smaller ones, if you will, are, are still substantial speakers, and like you mentioned there, I mean, these are like 50 pounds and 80 pounds or something like that. These are, the crew were moving some of them around. I mean, they're, they're uh, are they designed more for larger rooms and midfield applications, or can you use these for near fields? You can absolutely use them for near fields, and this is one of the benefits of using a, a mid-range coaxial in this regard. These will cohere, like the phase will all come together as close as eight inches away from them. Hmm. So you can have them very close to you on a meter bridge. You can have them further out in a the room. They will still serve you as well in either application. I think really, as far as the difference between the two models, if you have a, a significantly larger room, you definitely want to consider Quasar just for the amount of power it can put out into the room. But on the flip side of that, you know, we have some clients who are using Quasars in 9 by 10 rooms, and they're working for them. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. And I guess I have to ask, uh, not that these aren't enough for everybody, but are you expecting more members of the, uh, the family to, to show up as well? Uh, we, we are expecting. <laughs> um, uh, I, I can't give away too many of the details just yet, but we expect by the end of the year to flesh out our line with a small uh, little cuboid two-way that's going to be for near field and surround and Atmos applications. Very cool design. Uh, it's going to come with its own threaded mounting points, so it's very easy to set it up in object-based audio and surround systems. We have a new, more dedicated, smaller near field coming, still with its own subwoofer, just a little baby-sized subwoofer. Uh -huh. um, and then we have a flagship model coming that we intend for mastering studios and soffited mains. We can configure it either freestanding or soffit mount. Um, and that's the only one that comes with its own remote amp packs. Wow. Well, I, I have to say, I keep coming back to it, but they just sounded fantastic. I mean, the, the detail, and, and I mentioned the sweet spot is, is so cool, and the, the low frequencies are, are so solid, and there's not a, a sense of boominess or, or anything like that. It's just real bottom end, if you will, coming out of the cabinets. And the other co cool thing is that uh, what I noticed is as you move from Pulsar to Quasar and back, the character of what you're hearing doesn't change. It's just the little bit more. Yeah. Especially on the bottom end with and, the Quasar. And that's very intentional, right? Like, and we want this to stay the same across our entire line, like from the babyest ones all the way up to the biggest ones. Like, we're using the same material science, the same approach to the digital signal processing. We want to say, like, hey, this is for your application. It's not for a different sonic signature. If you need a little gigging monitor, if you need a little portable reference, that's why you would buy this one. If you need massive mains that can give you huge bass extension, that's why you'd buy the big ones. It's not because, oh, try this flavor, try that flavor. In the case of Pulsar and Quasar, from 200 hertz and up, especially, where the coaxials and the tweeters are, are working exactly the same way, they're identical. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Man, Dev, so cool. It's so exciting to have you here at, at Sweetwater. I mean, these are ultra premium monitors. So much technology, but it, what it really comes back down to is the sound quality. It's just fantastic. And uh, I heard the brief demo, and I'm, I'm hoping at some point I can get a, a set in my studio and do some mixing on them because they're, they're fantastic. Yeah, well, we're going to have a set in the SRC, so. <laughs> nice, the SRC being our library that we can borrow from here at Sweetwater. So that, that's very cool, man. I look forward to that. Pleasure to have you here, and, and welcome to Sweetwater. Oh, the pleasure was all mine. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> and thank you for joining us here today, Ex Machina. Very cool monitors. You got to check these out. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. <laughs>